We find opportunities that are of scale and we say could these opportunities be implemented and could the barriers be removed and who are the right people with the opportunity that is scalable on a global basis and could make a difference? Who can actually shift the barrier? Then that will flow and the, and the money will flow with it. And so I think that's the right model. Find the solutions that are truly scalable, are already proven, and there are many. And our, and our report, which we released in September called Capital is a Force for Good, um, discusses what we think are nine plus one, and the plus one is important, it's, uh, it's peace and dignity for all, and human security for all. Um, those are the things that actually can actually, we think, solve the leveling up of the world uh, and resolving this climate challenge we have. Um, I'm also a member of the World Academy of Art and Science, which has launched a, a campaign uh, with the UN called Human Security for All. And fundamentally what it says is human security is a term that sounds like it is about defense and arms uh, and weaponry and war, but it isn't. Human security is a, is a concept that each of us should have the security we need to flourish. And this idea of human flourishing is at the core of the idea that we all need security. Uh, so it's a fantastic campaign. It touches every the idea is to touch every individual with the thought that they deserve security. Uh, and that's why we have the UN, and that's why we all agree um, to the human, the human rights um, principles and rules and regulations. Those solutions we find are of three types. There are policy solutions, and the original SDGs were underpinned with the idea that we would implement policy change. Um, at the indicator level, when you examine them, uh, they require policy to change. So there are policy solutions. It's almost a third of the overall problem. Um, then there is uh, the private sector, which has solutions. That's 30 to 40 percent of, of the solution. Um, and then there is public spend. Um, there's, there's such a large base of government spend that if made green would make a huge difference too. And so we have three levels of, of solutions. Technology, though, is 40 to 50 percent cutting across all of that. And uh, the pace at which technology is, is allowing us to make this change, as we see with AI, is phenomenal. And, and actually, we can achieve, therefore, uh, just about everything we want to do if, if we can execute now and spread these solutions worldwide. Yes, you know, politicians, of course, will, will say what they have to say. Um, and that their job is to, to secure the power to fulfill their mandate. But I think individuals understand their own reality on the whole. Um, and we should have faith that they understand their reality well enough to know whether they can make the, the next check that they have to pay. And um, they will vote for the people they think understand that and will deliver to that. And so you saw that people that were too vague did not get elected. People that were, were a bit more specific or at least focused on the idea that people are smart and they need to understand that they would deliver to, to their needs got elected. And um, climate and its big burning issue, I think, is understood by the public. And most surveys show that actually the people understand all across the world, almost in every country, that climate is a phenomenon that affects their life. And uh, it's one of the big issues that needs solving. But you have to make sure you still meet the bills. And um, we have not created a world that does that. Most of our financial systems and capital systems are organized for about a third of the planet. Two thirds of the planet, even if they have bank accounts, um, and, and many of them don't, um, still do not have financial product that allows them to be part of the system. So this great success of the whole world over you know, 200 and something years since the Industrial Revolution has delivered a system which is suited and designed to serve about a third of the planet. See the massive challenge we still have, you know, to, to spread the wealth and to, to involve everybody else. You, you don't get to choose your relatives, right? <laughs> we don't get to choose who we're going to live with, but we, we're all in this together. And you, you see how climate affects everybody in the world. You know, it will flood Pakistan, it will, it will flood Florida. You know, um, but, you know, the indications are, are really clear in terms of where this is headed. Um, there, there is a series of floods, there is a temperature rise that, that leads to that, and it decimates whole industries and cities. Uh, and that path is very clear. Um, the longer the time goes on, the more radical breakthroughs we have to make to find solutions to stop that. So it is a race against time. You know, your theme 
uh, is, is, a, is an apt one. It, it is a race against time for us. Um, we, we have the faith, though, without, ever, without even articulating necessarily, all of us do, I think, that somehow we'll find the solution and the disaster won't happen. But the disasters have been happening at an alarming rate all around the world. And so our time is actually running out and it is quite precious. So we, we have to figure out the solutions. And I, I do believe, though, that the transition we have is complex because there's, there's a change potentially in the power structure of the world from a unipolar to a much more multipolar world, which we see. Um, we're about to go at the beginning of this century, it was just slightly over seven billion people. We're at eight and a half and we're headed to 10 just in the first 50 years of this century. That's a huge transition to add so many people to the planet, you know, almost adding two and a half billion people in the space of 50 years. Um, so, you know, that's a big challenge. And the third is we're switching from an industrial model to an information model. And so there are huge numbers of winners and losers in this process. But the transition is inevitable and almost unstoppable. And so um, the question is only how fast will we do it? So I, I, I have faith that we will do it. I wish we would do it at greater speed and unity to do it. But you don't get to choose that either. The electorate gets to choose that. I don't know, you know, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would hope that the right people would come and discuss the issues. But you notice a lot of countries are not represented here at the senior most levels. People have been focused on, on their elections, on their domestic issues. And so I don't know what we should actually get out of this COP despite the fact that there are so many people with goodwill, and I'm astonished as I walk around, how many solutions there are, how many people there are who are animated about saving the planet. That's one of the most exciting things about ever coming to COP. Um, in, a, in a few days that I'm here, I get to experience the excitement of humanity that is attended here, who think they can solve the world and make it a better place. And so it has a buzz about that, you know, we can save the world together. And so that's a, that's a wonderful buzz that people feel coming here. Um, everything, though, that comes out of the COPs has changed. COP26, I think, was a high point of optimism that galvanized not just the financial industry, but the world to think we would focus on solving everything. And I think, unfortunately, since then, the COPs have not managed to achieve the momentum and the solutions and the financing required. And so um, I, I, I hope we're pleasantly surprised this time. <laughs> but there has been a decline and the COP movement needs rejuvenation in some ways. Um, and so I, I hope this is a turning point and the COP30 then goes much, much further. Our challenge in our accounting system is that we have not priced fully the, the cost of how we got to where we are. And if we price the externalities, we will find that the, the profit and loss of the world was not as we imagined based on what the markets are pricing today. But the, the markets probably don't actually care. If we implemented a new system of accounting that recognized the real cost of, of polluting the environment, I think, it, I think actually the markets would follow that. Um, and talking to financial institutions on these sorts of issues, I find yeah. that they will follow what, what the rules are. So it's up, to the, it's up to the regulator to decide how we price these things. In terms of the fossil fuel industry, look, you know, it, it built the most powerful and wealthy civilization in all of human history. It enabled the biggest breakthroughs in science and technology and prosperity for the world overall. But it reached its limit in terms of what it could deliver. It is not the fuel that will allow us to go into space. It's not the fuel that will allow us to level up the world. It's not a fuel that allows another two billion people uh, or a billion and a half that we'll have in the next you know, 25 years to be prosperous. Um, but if we switch it off immediately, we'll have chaos. So it has, a, it has a role in the mix of energy, but the transition, the faster it happens, the better, because we, we, we need a cleaner solution. I actually don't believe today's renewable energy sources are the future. They're, they're merely transition energies. Everything we've invented today is merely a transition energy. The future that we need that builds a prosperity for 10 billion people and allows us to, to go into space, to unlock everything that we want to unlock, in terms of science, technology and, and wealth for, for everybody, requires an energy source that is clean, uh, abundant, near free, and that we can spread everywhere in the world. And we don't have that yet. We have the, the makings of it. The, the, the sun got, you know, some, somehow galvanized 
in a way that is different from today, an atomic energy that is different, like fusion, has the chance to deliver that. But there's nothing we have today which is operational, which is the basis of doing the things I've just described in the form it is today. So we, we have another breakthrough to make, which I believe will be made in the next decade or decade and a half, if you look at the speed at which uh, science is giving us breakthroughs. So, um, you know, this is where I would probably go back to my, uh, my roots, which would, um, and cultural and, and in terms of where I grew up. Um, and, I, and I grew up in the UK, and my, my original family roots are, are from India. I would say that there's something about being mindful of, of ourselves and our impact, which is important, and our relationship with each other and our relationship with the world. And um, one of the most fundamental things we will learn as human consciousness increases is how we do that and how we spread that as a, as a phenomena where every individual is far more aware of themselves their potential power and impact on the world around them and their relationship with everything. And I think that makes for what in the SDGs is described as a responsible individual that is a powerful asset to the world. Um, to get to that, as we know, you have to have solved the basics of human security for all, where you believe you're secure and you have a chance to go further. But I, I think the lessons um, of this approach to life illustrates that you always need to be secure, regardless of whether you're living in, in poverty or not. But it's very difficult living in poverty to be completely mindful. And so we, we have a task to solve that issue all across the world. And um, this future, in this future, the individual is the most powerful asset. The individual chooses their government and chooses what they buy. And if the individual chooses not to buy something, that business will go out of business. The most powerful asset I learn as I look at the financial system is the individual because they have two thirds of the world's money but one third is, is with government and they choose that government. So um, the rising consciousness is that every individual, no matter poor or rich, in every place where they get to cast a vote, either at a ballot box or when they buy something, is a powerful asset. Thank you. <laughs>